Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to talk to you today about some of the things that I know that we as a community in the Aval as the Avalanche community are working on. So this is not just things that I'm involved in. It is from my vantage point. Uh, so it's things that I know about. There's much, much more. Uh, I, th I would say that about uh, maybe five or six months ago, I lost the ability to track everything that's happening. So uh, there is unfortunately not going to be a comprehensive view of everything that's happening in Avalanche. It is no longer possible for me to list everything that, that's happening. It's just too big. But I do want to share with you some of the exciting things that I, as a techie, find, uh, find uh, compelling. And, uh, and so I want to leak some alpha, and I want to give you a glimpse of things to come in the Avalanche community. So as you know, we have a very strong history of innovation. We bring hard science to this nascent area where it's badly called for. There are many large, open, outstanding scientific challenges ahead of us. That's the reason why many other projects have stalled. That's the reason why they were not able to make forward progress as fast as they would have liked. And we are one of the, the few teams that have the expertise to bring in scientific solutions to long-standing, open, hard problems. We did this with consensus protocols, with bridges, with DEXs, with swaps, etc., and we're doing it as a community across the board all throughout the software stack. So what I'm going to do today is just go very, very quickly, I only have 20 minutes, and give you a glimpse of the various different things that we're working on. It's a subsampled set. This is not the comprehensive roadmap. It's just what it is, uh, just some of the things that I wanted to pull out and, and illustrate for you. There is a lot happening, and I want to start at the platform level. One of the main things that's happening at the platform level is that we're continually working on, on scaling and making cheaper and faster the ba basic platform. This is critical for all of us. The scaling challenge is not a one-size-fits-all kind of, it does, there is no such thing as a silver bullet. It's an ongoing thing. As you make things cheaper, more load comes onto the chains. The demand for blockchain space is intense. There's 700 trillion worth of assets, I keep saying this, and there's going to be more as we create the ability for people to create more virtual assets. All of that value, as it goes on to chains, it's going to crowd out other uses, and that you need to have the right kind of infrastructure to absorb this. Luckily, with subnets, we do, and I want to get into that in a second. But there's also the need for continually improving the basic protocols for, uh, for executing transactions on a chain. We've been doing this with Snowman++. So for those of you who are new or who haven't had a chance to follow what's going on there, Snowman++ has already been deployed. And uh, I would say maybe I forgot how many months ago, but a few months ago, we completed with the Apricot release the, the deployment of Snowman++, which gave us the notion of a soft leader that greatly reduced contention in the network. Those of you who run, how many people here run validators? Okay, well, so those of you who run validators will know that your, your uh, I.O. needs drop drastically, your space consumption dropped drastically with this release, and that was a fantastic thing to do. Um, so that's one of the things that we did already, and in the same vein, there is another release coming out called Avalanche V2. It's going to bring with it fast synchronization. So as chains grow, we have the, the problem that syncing up a node or bringing a node up for the first time can take some time. We want that to be incredibly fast. And there are very simple techniques for actually addressing this issue. It's not a hard problem. Uh, it's engineering-wise maybe you know, difficult, but it's not a conceptually difficult problem. So we're going to be introducing fast sync and secure checkpointing to the chain. And with that, it's going to be very, very fast to bring up a node, to catch up to the latest state of the network, and to go forward from there. For, imagine a game that has been working on a subnet for some time. You want that game, you want the players in that game to bring up a node and participate with no friction whatsoever. It should be instantaneous, and that's what we're working towards. So I'm really excited about Avalanche V2. We will also be introducing changes that, uh, that reduce and, uh, and uh, that, that, that essentially uh, turn... Oh, you guys might not be able to see this. Ah, well, we have a bit of an issue with... I uh, use the entire, uh, entire space here. So uh, maybe we could just pull these up. Okay, so um, thank you. So, uh, so we're going to be... Uh, so one of the things I noticed or we learned after we deployed our system is that we have this amazing DAG that we can build on the X chain with the Avalanche virtual machine. A DAG is a directed acyclic graph. It allows many concurrent activities to take, uh, take place in the network. 
And it's one of, the, one of the, the, the many tricks that we use to get extra performance. It turns out that a lot of exchanges are not really geared for concurrent activities. They started out life by supporting Bitcoin, which builds a single linear chain. And, uh, and so we discovered that, uh, that it's actually not easy to integrate with exchanges if you have a DAG. So we're going to be, for those people who want to create subnets, uh, based on value creation, etc., we're going to be creating, uh, we're going to be giving them the option to create a linear chain using the Avalanche virtual machine. So for those of you who want to create assets, do asset transfers, etc., in your subnet, and you want to integrate with exchanges easily, this is going to be one of, the, one of the primary mechanisms. And at the same time, we might want to simplify the distinction between the X and the P chains and also simplify their operation. So there's going to be a unification under the covers at the platform level. That too, at the same time, should also come with some simplifications at the UI level. I know a lot of you uh, took the, the trouble to figure out what's happening behind the covers, and the wallet actually displays all that to you. Uh, I'm hoping that the UI will be simplified so that you guys don't really have to understand the X difference, the P difference, the C chain difference, etc. That should all be seamless and easier to use. We're working on a new EVM. We've been working on a new EVM for some time. It's a much, much, much faster EVM. It's, uh, it's, doing, uh, it's essentially doing, it's got a lot of optimizations behind the scenes. And uh, one of the main things it's doing is it's doing state management differently than, uh, than what you see in GET. And uh, it also has some mechanisms that we're, we're currently adding into it for control of state growth. So this is something that a lot of people bring up, which is, oh, you're super fast now, but in the future, there is going to be the specter of state growth that's going to get you. And, uh, and I've often said to this in response on, on Twitter, trust us, there is a solution. Well, now we're sharing with you for the first time that indeed we've been working on a solution for controlling state growth. Um, so so that, that specter, that like, ghost that's going to come and kill us, it's not really there. There are, there are, there are engineering challenges here for sure, it's not easy, for sure, but it is something that we've been working on. We also have been building a new database designed for cryptocurrencies. You may or may not be aware of this, but every single cryptocurrency behind the scenes has a database underneath. And almost everybody uses either the same database or the same, or you know, one of the, one of the variants of the same idea, level DB from Google. And uh, we've been developing our own that is not only super fast, but it's actually designed for the use cases, the lookup patterns that you see in cryptocurrencies. LevelDB and other databases that you've all heard of are designed for a very different set of benchmarks and a very different set of, uh, set of load patterns. But once you actually look at cryptocurrencies that have different lookups, you're going to you notice as a technical person that suddenly uh, this thing has actually should be built entirely differently because the lookup patterns are very, very different. So we've been doing exactly that. I cannot wait to uh, unveil this when the time is right. And, uh, and there is a lot of technical work going on in this space. I now want to tell you all about subnets. Subnets are big. This is one of the main ways we parallelize and separate from each, from each other different applications uh, that, uh, that need to be either performance isolated or fee isolated or need, uh, need special features for these. The main uh, incentive program that allows people to, uh, uh, to use subnets is called Multiverse. And uh, the Multiverse program is uh, in place and it's starting out with DeFi applications that are very demanding as well as GameFi applications. So every big uh, contract on the C chain that's currently consuming a lot of gas should think about going into its own subnet. And you're going to see, for example, Dexalot, which is a fantastic application. It's a central limit order book. It happens to, to consume a lot of gas. That's a prime example of something that would be best deployed in its own subnet. And uh, this will open, for all of you who are interested, the opportunity to serve as validators for this new ecosystem of uh, this multiverse of validators. So there is a lot of interesting incentives that will come into play as people start migrating from the C chain, from a single monolithic chain to, uh, to this multiverse universe where there's a whole lot of chains in parallel. We've been working on or we've been thinking about a low MEV subnet. You've heard of MEV. This is uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, th th those of you who've ever traded on Uniswap, on Ethereum, know that you are constantly sniped that somebody comes between you and the thing you want to buy. 
And uh, we've been thinking about mechanisms, some based on commit reveal schemes, that lower the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the MEV extractable by other parties on chain. This is forever going to be a cat and mouse game. But, uh, but we, can, we can get, a w get way ahead of the mice in this game by introducing some technologies, basically some, uh, some basic crypto and some trade-offs of latency for security or of latency for user experience. So one of the things we're thinking about is a subnet that, has, that essentially does not have the same super fast latency as the main C chain. It might be maybe a few times, like instead of a, a sub-second latency, it achieves five-second latency. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's able to, uh, to, uh, to re greatly reduce uh, MEV extraction for the people who are uh, for doing that. Now, uh, one of the things that I lament often is that this MEV area is very, very nascent. And we lack the terminology and we lack the metrics necessary to discuss it in a, in, a, in a properly scientific manner. I cannot wait for that research to develop so that we can, in some calm, objective manner, compare different system designs and evaluate them for, uh, for their impact on MEV. Another thing that, uh, that I know that some people have been working on is uh, privacy for smart contract execution. So a subnet with a virtual machine based on homomorphic encryption would be one of the, or is one of the, the methods by which you can do, you can assure blinded computations, computations where the data is not revealed, but nevertheless smart contracts operate according to a, a prescribed uh, recipe. Another thing, of course, is ZK SNARKs, and we're working with the world experts on this uh, to, uh, to bring some private computation, uh, for, for, to bring private execution onto a subnet near you. And, uh, and we've been working for some time now, now on novel virtual machines. So one of, the, one of the things that I actually worked on about a year ago was quantum safe compu computing and quantum safe signatures. So we actually have this already mostly written, I'm not essentially written, not perhaps as a subnet, but essentially future complete effort uh, that uses lattice-based cryptography to give us quantum, quantum security. Quantum security is something that I get a lot of questions about but it's not something that, that keeps me up at night at all. So I don't want you guys to freak out about it because I think it's still many, many, many years away. We have a lot of time to deploy any solution in this space. But to just as to serve as an example for people who are interested, we are going to be uh, opening up some of the code here to show you, hey, if you wanted to do something different, this is how you would do it. And, uh, and you can use different cryptography other than the default ones on the default network. We also worked on, at some time ago, on, uh, on a Wasm VM. So we have the Wasm VM ready, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, essentially something that we have not exposed to the public because we did not see a need for it. But expect that, uh, that uh, that's something that we will work on if, indeed, a Wasm-based smart contract ecosystem does develop. But for now, our focus is, is mostly on the EVM side. Okay, well, um, I would say about... Uh, I don't know how long ago, maybe seven or eight months ago, I said that the, there's going to be a year of the Battle of the Bridges. And that year of the Battle of the Bridges is upon us. Um, luckily, we're winning this war. The Avalanche Bridge is by far the, uh, the, one, the, the biggest bridge uh, from Ethereum. And uh, it has, I think, the number one in terms of, um, of TVL, total value locked. It has had about $43 billion flow in about 243,000 transactions between Ethereum and Avalanche. So it achieves this by using a technology that nobody else brought to the space of blockchains. That technology is called Intel's SGX. It is the thing that allows us to execute this bridge in a manner where nobody, not even insiders, could abuse the bridge and, uh, and end up acquiring custody of the funds. So this non-custodial bridge is essentially a very interesting uh, way to approach this trusted computing or trustworthy computing problem. So, um, so we have the best, what I would consider the best in class bridge. How many people here have used the bridge? Some of you are avalanche natives. Or those of you who have not, probably avalanche natives. We love you all. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so if you don't have a need to use it, that's even better. Uh, but those of you who have used it have noticed just how fast it is and how pleasant it is to use. So expect that same idea, that same technology to be applied to different areas. And um, in addition to, uh, to the features already on the bridge, we just announced support for Bitcoin. This, I think, is big. So that's, thank you.
that's, uh, that's about a trillion dollars worth of assets that are not able to partake in DeFi that can suddenly flow through our bridge and come onto the Avalanche ecosystem, where they execute with instant finality and they participate in the rich set of uh, smart contracts that we have on board. So I'm really, really thrilled about this. That's actually uh, exactly from, the, from the, uh, the bridge itself. We're also working on protocol level bridging. So in case uh, you wanted bridging options or in case you wanted to bridge between subnets uh, that are sort of on the, in the long tail, then you need to be able to count on some universal bridging technology that maybe is not as pleasant to use as, as the bridge that we have based on SGX. It might actually cost more. It might actually have lo longer latencies. But nevertheless, it's a secure bridge that you can count on to be there, and that's something that we are working on as well. So in this new subnet universe, you should not have to worry about how to transfer assets. It's just going to be there for you. So uh, I think yesterday we talked about a new wallet. It's time for a new wallet, is it not? Okay. So, so we have a... Um, We've been working on a new wallet that has three different forms. One of them is uh, the browser extension that just is inside the browser and gives you the seamless way to connect to dApps. Another uh, instance of it is as a mobile app. It's the same code, actually, but it ends up working in different ways. And also, there's a, there's a desktop wallet to replace the current wallet that bridge that, that wallet that uh, avax that network. So um, all three of these are, um, are essentially going to be giving you a, a seamless experience where you can just easily interact with dApps on, uh, on chain. The wallet has amazing features, and I, I cannot thank the wallet team enough. enough. They've been working really, really hard, as, as have we all. Um, but it is ledger enabled. So you should all be using hardware wallets, by the way. Uh, they're very, very important. We've been supporting them uh, since a long time ago. We will continue to support them. And this ledger, ledgers are, are, are pretty key to protecting yourself from malware. It has portfolio and collectibles, so it supports NFTs. And uh, it has integration with dApps and the bridge. So using the bridge should be seamless. Value should flow to where it, it's, it's operated on the best. And it should be one seamless, fast transaction. Swapping between hundreds of tokens directly from the wallet is supported. And uh, you should also be able to buy Avax directly from the wallet. The integration with the actual money flows, etc., should be should be part of the experience. So this is coming up. There are some amazing screenshots that the team gave me. I think some of you might have seen this. I think it looks beautiful. And uh, we're going with the owl for now. Um, so uh, we'll see how it works. And uh, so here it is. It's going to be a fun experience. I cannot wait for the wallet to be out. I'm hoping that you will all help me uh, when we unveil it, test it out, etc., and provide feedback. So um, OK, moving forward. We want to expand, of course, uh, and expand the support for ecosystem projects to support mass adoption. You know all about the Avalanche Rush program. It continues to operate. We committed an enormous amount of funds, and uh, so we have a lot of resources going into supporting the C-Chain for DeFi projects. You know that we have a lot of protocols supported on there. All of the blue chips are there. And uh, you, you may or may not know, but I have spoken here at this summit to a lot of projects that are doing very innovative things on the lending side, on the stable swap side, and I'm, I'm very proud of the development happening here. It's always fascinating to see the young energetic projects on top of Avalanche. Uh, it's always great to see the cutting edge taking place on Avalanche. It's not happening on other chains. It's great to see new DEXs. There's so much more we can do, and if I have time, I, I would go on a long rant. But those of you who've been in crypto, know that we've, we've had the following dynamic. For the last umpteen years that I've been in crypto, some people go before the regulators and they say, hey, you know, we would like to uh, have an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF. How many times have we had a Bitcoin ETF proposal proposed and then rejected by regulators? Kept happening over and over again. And the regulators kept saying the same stupid thing, which was, which I thought, it's not actually stupid, let me take that back. But the same thing that's really annoying, which is your marketplaces are not quite trustworthy. We would open this up, we would allow this ETF, but it's really, they're so manipulable and manipulated so often that we don't feel comfortable opening the public to an ETF. They aren't wrong. But the thing is, we have the technology to build marketplaces that are more secure than TradFi. We have the technology to go back to these regulators and say, look, we can do better than Wall Street. 
We can, we, the, this, the bar isn't where Wall Street is at. You keep rejecting us because you think we don't meet the bar. We will carry the bar further up. We can build, well, we can build DEXs with no front running, with no stop loss hunting, with actual privacy controls. This is all possible by virtue of these, uh, these, these cryptographic assets. And we can build it into the fabric of a DEX so deep that these, these guarantees are there for all time. So I'm really thrilled about this. There are new options platforms coming online on Avalanche. Uh, some of you might have heard some of the talks here uh, about this. There are many other dApps that I don't have time for. NFTs. On this front, this is kind of interesting. Um, we ended up prioritizing at the Av um, Avalanche Foundation the growth of the DeFi ecosystem. We did essentially nothing to support NFTs for a long time. We we're a latecomer to the NFT game. And for the longest time, I was kind of resigned to letting Solana take the lead on NFTs. And, um, but the fact that we are fast, pleasant to use, has actually been a huge boon to us. And the fact that we are a proof of stake system has been a great enabler. Artists care about the environment. They don't want to build systems that you know, do terrible things to, to climate. And uh, we've had a, a number of uh, people come to us for exactly this reason. And we now have a burgeoning NFT space uh, with, uh, with, with traffic, with uh, total volume now exceeding Solana's. Solana has done a lot of focusing on this. Our marketplaces are still maturing. Those of you who interacted with the various different uh, Avalanche native marketplaces uh, here at the summit, or those of you who got a chance to see their demos of their upcoming releases, you will be amazed. There's some amazing demos that I have seen, so expect the marketplace, uh, marketplace um, experience to improve tremendously. So, uh, and expect big commitments from the Avalanche Foundation to help foster growth in the NFT space. We want to attract more, more creators, more artists to help us build, uh, build a, a better NFT system. Uh, there's a lot of work on the stablecoin front. There is, of course, you guys are familiar with uh, USDT and USDC. They are now native. And uh, we are starting the process of creating incentives for people to go from bridged assets to native assets. I encourage all of you to do the same. I think there's, it's always best to reduce what we call the trusted computing base, the amount of code you trust behind a valuable asset. So the native versions of these assets are always preferable, and there are going to be slight incentives uh, for con doing a conversion, and I encourage you to do that. Algorithmic stablecoins are a fascinating field, and given the regulatory developments in the space, it's high time for us to look carefully at algorithmic stablecoins. Let me also mention outright that it's not easy to build these things. There are some scientific challenges that must be overcome, but expect some, uh, some big moves to, uh, to bring uh, high value algorithmic stable coins to the avalanche space. We've been working, unlike many other projects, we do not view ourselves as a tech only platform. We, and I know I and friends, etc., and other people in the space have been working constantly to build new asset classes. One of these are ILOs, initial litigation offerings. The very first one took place to with not that much fanfare, perhaps, and perhaps during a down market, but it did happen successfully with Apotheo. It's a case of crop destruction in the United States where the uh, or litigant needed to raise money to go and sue the state for, uh, for essentially uh, uh, for lack of due process. It was structured around existing litigation financing. Expect uh, further ILOs, expect that sp space to grow tremendously. I do know that a lot of, for a lot of crypto degens, uh, the structure of the very first ILO was not all that financially attractive, and expect that to change. Expect, that, uh, expect, the, expect the incentives to be more in line with the crypto savvy audience in the future. There are also initial film offerings coming up. I'm excited about these. Um, so there's going to be uh, essentially standard templates that people can use, legal as well as code, to uh, get financing for their films and artwork on, uh, on chain. GameFi is really, really big, and uh, so this is an exciting space. Um, expect significant entertainment and culture uh, growth on top of the chain. Subnets here are a critical differentiator. Games are coming online because they can have their own dedicated blockchain, because they can have their own dedicated subnet. Finally, or close to finally, um, we're, we're looking at close layer one to layer one collaborations. There are layer ones out there that provide interesting features. 
expect the avalanche community to, uh, to do whatever it takes to bring other communities together and to provide some of the unique features, the technical features we offer to other communities. That way we will create sort of gestalt value, that is where the sum of the value in both systems is greater than the, than the value in the parts. So in fact, one of the interesting cases that you can expect is the fact that Avalanche's benefits could even be carried over to proof of work chains. That is, we use Avalanche for settling the transactions, but we use proof of work to support the chains that actually believe very heavily in proof of work or they have a strong mining infrastructure that they want to support. So there's going to be interesting developments on that front in the year ahead. And uh, one of the other interesting things that I've been spending a bunch of time on, one of the things that differentiates uh, at least the big efforts around here from others, is the fact that, uh, that many of us have always targeted value creation on chain from the get-go. One of the things we're doing is a walled garden for Wall Street. What's a walled garden for Wall Street? It's a regulatory compliant network for, uh, for allowing people to engage in DeFi knowing who their counterparts are in every trade. This is a critical enabler. There are, there's lots and lots of institutional money, but it cannot partake in DeFi because of regulatory constraints. They have strong KYC AML requirements. And it's possible to support them in a, in a proper setting uh, while maintaining the, the true spirit of DeFi. So you want to make sure that unwanteds are not there, you don't want to be trading with a terrorist and enabling them to do their thing, but at the same time, you do want to be trading with other people like here uh, in, a, in a proper fashion with DeFi support. So, um, I think I went over a little bit, but there was so much happening that I needed to summarize for you, that's so much happening, uh, so much that was on my mind. Overall, Avalanche is in hyper growth. You just open up any metric that you like, you will see a hockey stick. And I'm thrilled about that. Or you look at the energy in this room or in any, other, in any of the other tents, you, I think, we'll, we'll, are going to be uh, you know, essentially blown away by the energy there and by the vibe there. Avalanche Foundation has already committed to spending more than a billion dollars. It's going to commit to spending even more over the years ahead to build an amazing community and an amazing ecosystem of applications. There's Rush, there's Multiverse, there will be more. And finally, we came to where we are. We reached where we are as a community by focusing on science, on technology, and, uh, and superior execution. Thank you so much for allowing us to come here. I'm looking forward to your help. Thank you.